Hi there, I'm Greg. I get contacted often from colleagues looking to integrate ThingWorks with Azure IoT, often with Kepware or KepServer EX. In the past, I've done a couple of videos on the topic. Uh, however, I've gotten comments from people that it's either too simple or far too complex. So the purpose of today's session is to try and find a good middle ground uh, that dives a little bit deeper into some of the inner workings of ThingWorks and the Azure IoT Hub Connector and how that can be used with Kepware and the IoT Gateway using MQTT uh, to get things um, talking for demonstration and integration purposes. Videos. Looking at the new Azure Industrial IoT integration with ThingWorks and we ended off here on the third video where I had gone through a demonstration using three different OPC UA servers, getting them connected up to Azure IoT Edge and across the Azure Industrial IoT uh, application stack to ThingWorks. And some comments that I've gotten from people is um, A, that's great, but B, that's far too complex for the demo purposes that I have, uh, where they've needed just to get some data coming from PLC, uh, across Azure IoT and get that coming into ThingWorks. And frankly, we don't really have a whole lot of um, explanations around the topic aside from what exists from the, uh, the Kepware team. So I wanted to take the opportunity today not only to help a number of colleagues who have asked me this, but to share with the broader community. So let's jump into it. Integration between Kepware and ThingWorks using IoT Gateway uh, and MQTT over Azure IoT Hub. So this really is meant for demonstration purposes. It's, it's not necessarily going to fit all use cases. And the de facto approach for doing this from a ThingWorks perspective is still using the industrial um, IoT integration with OPC UA. But in any case, as we do know, there are some use cases where this can be ex extremely relevant. Um, we're going to dive into it because it's also a good opportunity to understand better how the uh, Kepware IoT gateway works as well as really how the telemetry aspect of things work around the ThingWorks Azure IoT Hub Connector. So this is actually kind of an old um, architecture view of things. This is how uh, we used to do things before the OPC UA integration, leveraging the IoT gateway plugin for Kep Kepware that essentially provides the ability to uh, MQTT agent and pushing the uh, messages directly up to IoT Hub. So previously, um, you know, we don't have automatic import capabilities of the model. So this is really what I wanted to try and touch on today is to kind of go through some concepts of how we're gonna open up the JSON payload from the Kepware and what we can do with that once we get it into ThingWorks and try and kind of come up with an automated way of provisioning uh, PLCs that might be coming online in ThingWorks, despite the fact that we don't have the um, those nice enhancements that are coming with the Azure Industrial IoT demo. So there is a variation on this that I'm I'm not uh, going to show today. But if we do put an Azure IoT Edge in here in the middle, uh, the benefit that we're going to get here is being able to have store and forward capabilities in the IoT Edge, and essentially everything should work like what we're looking at today, except instead of pointing um, the IoT gateway to the IoT hub, we should be pointing it to the IoT edge. Obviously, there's a little bit more setup to go through on there, but let's um, let's quickly get started over here. And by doing that, I'm going to just say Kepware um, as your IoT hub. And we're going to have a look at our starting point. And our starting point is really this great document um, by one of my colleagues, some of my colleagues. Um, over in the Kepware team. And really, it's a, a quite old document as it goes back a couple of years, but nothing has really changed in the scenario. Kepsure EX and Azure IoT Hub. And as I mentioned, this is really leveraging the uh, IoT gateway component. And basically, there's only a, a few parts to this that we're going to need. Uh, one, obviously, we need to make sure we get the IoT gateway up and running. We do need a JRE to do that. Um, I've already got that set up, and um, really we're going to pick up on what we did in the MX chip video, where we're going to use VS um, code here to monitor the Azure IoT Hub. So let's just kind of hop right into that. Um, 
And here I do have the connection already to my IoT hub where I've got a number of um, devices and IoT edges that are already created. Um, and then over here, I have my Kepware, which is just simulating some things. And I've got a PLC. Why, why don't we pretend that this uh, simulated PLC is uh, serving a number of lines in a particular plant um, using the default simulation here, randoms and ramps. And um, so let's just come back here and we're going to start by coming into the IoT Hub. We're going to create a new IoT device for this particular plant. We'll set up a new plant. Can't remember what I called the plant. Newbury. Okay, so in the UK, Newbury plant, and we're going to set up line three. So I've already set up lines one and two. We'll have a look later at what that um, comes to. But now I've just created my line three device. And if I come back over here to VS Code and do a refresh, I see that the Newbury plant line three comes up. And um, all of this is outlined in the documentation. But one thing I do need to do is to... Um, do that in a second actually we'll come back to that just so that i don't lose the um, paste buffer um, i am going to need the host name for my iot hub in kepware so if i come over to kepware and go to my iot gateway and say add agent we're going to call this line three and mqtt client now it wants to know where we're going to be uh, connecting to so here we can go ssl We'll paste in that address for the IoT Hub uh, on port 8883. And the topic is, um, I believe it's devices slash the name. Newbury plant dash one three slash messages slash events. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. This is a great place to do it. Um, QoS, you know, some of these things are, are MQTC uh, specific. The QoS is timeout, wide format, narrow format. Difference between wide format and narrow format here is explained in the Kepler documentation. But basically, it means whatever tags that I put in here, if I use wide format, it's going to create a column for each of those tags. If I use narrow format, it's essentially going to have a single column. Uh, similar to a database table where it's going to have those values. So narrow format is, is a good approach for lots of tags, but wide format can be more appropriate. If I want to know, for example, five tags and I want to get them every five seconds, then wide format is actually better because what's going to happen is this is the, uh, the overall queue rate. So every 10 seconds, we're going to send an NQTT message containing all of the updates. If we're using narrow format, those updates are likely going to be um, uh, captured and stored until that 10 second timer has, has expired. Whereas wide format is just going to send every 10 seconds an update of each of the tags. So depending on our use case, we're going to have a slower response uh, with a 10 second interval for wide format, but we also are going to be able to optimize our data transfer as well as be sure that when we are comparing values from uh, three or four tags, that we also know that it's exactly at that particular point in time that we're looking at values from the other ones, whereas that might not be the case if we're using narrow. So we will go with narrow format. Um, client ID, I believe is, um, the name of our device. Uh, and then so the username is the IoT Hub followed by the name of our device. And now we need a password. So the password is a SAS token and we can come over here to the um, VS code to generate our SAS token. And if we just right click on the device over here, we can say generate SAS token for device. And it wants to know how long uh, this SAS token should be valid for. And um, we'll use one year 
8760 hours. Okay, so we get this SAS token. It's already copied it to my um, paste buffer. So let's come back over here and paste it in here. Um, I'm also going to just disable this into the, until we get it set up. And now I'm going to come into the settings and for fun, I'm going to paste the SAS token into the description just in case we need to come back and grab it uh, for any purpose later. Um, okay, so now we have set up our agent. So we do have this agent configured. And if we have a look here in the properties, we can see we are using uh, TLS. It says SSL, but obviously it's going to be TLS because SSL is deprecated. Um, devices, UK, Newbury, Planet, Line 3, Messages, Events. We do need to have that last slash on the topic name where we're going to publish to. Uh, here we can change the rates and the narrow format and, and all those things that we talked about previously. And the message format is the standard template. So a few words about this. The standard template, if we have a look at it here, it's going to... Um, it's going to essentially put timestamp and then uh, an object, a JSON object that contains the values. So because of the fact we're using the narrow format, it's going to essentially have a server timestamp. And for that timestamp, this will be the send interval. And then we're going to have a whole bunch of collection of values, uh, value key value pairs in there for the values. So if I did want to change that, you know, we can use the advanced template and come up with a, a very custom um, payload type. But for our purposes, I think uh, I was able to get it working with the the default payload um, the, that uh, Kipware employs. So we're just going to leave it like that. And here we can come into the security and see also the, um, all of our configurations. If we do have any problems with the client ID or username or password, there's a good likelihood you're going to have to come back in here to, to check and change things. Now, you might notice this pop-up coming up down here. I don't actually have um, a license installed on this Kipware server, so I am using the uh, the two-hour trial of the that activates by default of the IoT gateway. So this is also quite handy if we are just doing tests or demos or things like this. It is sufficient even without a license to be able to use the IoT gateway. So um, let's add some tags to it. I click add IoT items and, um, and I'm really just using three tags for the PLC. So I've got the PLC simulator in here. And I'm basically just using this number here to indicate the line that they're coming from. So we're going to grab the ramp three, uh, sign three, ramp three, random three, and sign three. We'll add those. Now here it's saying scan rate 1,000 milliseconds. So what is this all about? What's going to happen here is this is the rate at which it's going to pull the um, tag cache. So Regardless of how quickly the data is being brought into uh, the Kepware tag cache, it's important to note that here what we're talking about is only how fast I'm going to consult the tag cache. So if my values are coming in at 100 milliseconds from PLCs, this has nothing to do with it. If my values are coming in at one minute from a PLCs, it makes absolutely no sense to be scanning that every one second. And that's important to know because it can have some um, unexpected consequences if we um, get inappropriately matched scan rates here on the IoT gateway versus what's coming in on the PLC. So this is really a memory scan. This is what's going to happen when we're scanning that, that cache. And that would be more relevant if we're going to be using this dead band. I could, for example, watch very quickly, and we'll do that on here. We'll put 250 milliseconds. Uh, I guess we could even go faster. We'll leave it at 250. And then uh, we'll say only on data changes and dead band of, um, so zero is just going to be any change. So even very small changes, we'll pick them up very quickly. And they'll be added to that list of tags that are going to be updated. Conversely, if I didn't want to um, have these tags scan this way, I could just say every scan. And every scan means regardless of how much it's changed, um, you know, let's make sure those get sent up. Actually, may as well go with, um, we'll go with something slower, 500, and we'll say on every scan. Okay, so that's pretty fast, 500 milliseconds for these three tags. Uh, really don't need that much data, but um, 
whatever. So let's enable this. And um, I've noticed it does take a, does take a minute or so to get all connected to IoT Hub. Uh, and we will see a message down here. Oh, look at this. MQTT agent line three is connected to broker. So this is perfect. Frankly, I didn't get it on the first um, tries for the line one and line two. So I'm happy that uh, line three has come online so so simply. And now let's come back over to um, VS Code. Um, personally, I like to, to diagnose and to validate things as we go up the overall data collection chain, just to really make sure that we're wiring things up um, appropriately um along the way so that we don't end up in a situation where we don't have anything working and we have absolutely no idea where the problem is so this is the next step right we are pushing directly to iot hub i just hit the refresh button up here and we got a couple of things we see here we do have an online status for this uh plant line three now excellent so let's come in here and let's start monitoring the built-in endpoint And we should see some messages coming in. So here we do see uh, a payload for uh, Newbury plant line two. And you can see the narrow format data structure that I was talking about where we have the uh, ID for one of the tags, a V, a Q, and a T. This is the value, this is the quality, and this is the timestamp. And basically for each of those updates, you know, we talked about the 250 millisecond scan time or on ch change, we're going to have a, a you know, a key value pair here for that particular update. So here's one for random two, one for ramp two, and one for sign two. So uh, we should also see the same thing over for the other plants. If we come all the way to the bottom, um, so, okay. So there we go. We have our first message for line three. Um, and we're actually going to do something a little bit different here from the default. In the client, we're going to change this rate from 10,000 milliseconds to 5,000 milliseconds. So what that's going to do is it's actually going to be sending the updates every five seconds instead of every 10 seconds. So the, the packages are going to be smaller, um, but we'll see them more frequently. Okay, there we go. So we do have some more coming in for line three, line two, and line two and line one are both set up to be every 10 seconds. So if I come into the IoT hub, you know, I should see kind of over the past little while, we do have... Um, you know, some values that have been coming in progressively, numbers of messages used over the course of the day as I've been setting this up. And we do have a little bit of a peak here as I've added the, um, the line three. Great, so the data is coming into, um, data is coming into IoT Hub. We're actually gonna skip validating things at the um, IoT Hub connector level, because I know this is working. And frankly, I mean, I would go over to that if I, I was getting it set up initially, but I've already tested this with the MX chip, um, which we can actually kind of quickly bring up here. You know, really just to kind of look at a little bit of the difference of the messages. So if I run this, I'm gonna come back over here We'll try and turn this off, built-in endpoint. So these were the messages from Kepware using the Kepware data format. Um, and you can see you can see here that we, we have the start of the message followed by this timestamp. This is what we saw in the configuration followed by this values. So all of the values are in here. And, and unfortunately, it was really easy for us with the MX chip to map things because we had this timestamp and this values um, properties or keys that were coming in. But as you can see here, we're really going to have to do something to take these apart in ThingWorks that is not going to be as easy as the um, as the MX chip. Um, so we did uh, have that guy sending, and uh, so let's just clear this. Okay, and let's see if we can't. We're just going to monitor the dev kit SIM device, which is the MX chip um, that was sending some values over there. 
So here you can see we just have a really simple message structure. There's a message ID, there's a device ID, and there's a temperature. Because it's bound to this particular dev kit sim, this is what's providing the context to know what asset it is. It isn't even really telling us what asset it is. This device ID is just in our in our context, it's useless. It's a description, but really, what's important to us is the temperature and humidity. And we did see previously in ThingWorks that these were really easy to map to to ThingWorks because of the. Um, uh, let's just have a look at it. Because of this MX chip thing template that I had set up, and this MX chip thing template inherits from the Azure IoT thing, so it's going to establish the connection to the IoT hub, bring in all the services that we're going to need, and all I did when I created this template was I added a couple of um, properties here, put in some units, and I said, hey, look, this temperature is a remotely bound property, and here's what its name is. And the great thing about that is, is we get the auto binding capabilities. When we do see that we're this thing is connected, uh, it's going to auto bind to this temperature. But because of how things work in, in um, what's it called, Kepware, we have a three part. We got the channel, we've got the device, and then we've got the tag. And those are actually going to come up in the in the ID field. So actually getting those mapped to ThingWorks properties is going to be, uh, I don't want to say a lot more complex, but it's going to be more complex. So let's get into it. This is where we left off. The concept here was I imported the MX chip TT thing. Let's do the same thing over here. We're going to use the connection services hub now it's not the first one it's the second one unfortunately the icon is the same for things and thing templates and we want the actual thing we don't want the template so we get the thing connection services hub and this connection services hub is essentially the parent of the azure iot hub template so this is what is implementing the services to talk to uh to azure and so when i come over to services here i can just go Search for import, and here you can see I've got this service to import Azure IoT devices, which I also did in the MX chip thing. Differences here, what I'm going to do, we'll get rid of that. Uh, I'm going to use this pattern, UK dash, just so that we're just bringing in the new UK um, plant devices. And um, we're going to use the Azure IoT thing, the base one that comes with it, and we're going to see what happens. Okay, so it's done. Um, so we've got the Newbury plant line three that has been imported from the connection services import. Now, similarly to the other times I've shown this, I don't really know why this is, but you do have to fill in the property for the Azure IoT hub um, to tell it where it's getting its connection from. And when we click save, we notice that it comes online. So this is kind of like the green uh, indicator that we had in VS code. Uh, we do see some values as far as the date and the time that it was last connected and last reporting. It does say it's, it's connected and reporting, so this is great. It's there. Um, now what? Well, that's about it. That's all we got. So we're going to add a property. We're going to try and do that. Um, remote tag binding thing that I just mentioned. Now, if you recall in the payload, there was one called values. There was two There was two tags that were coming in on the JSON payload. One was timestamp and one was values. So we're going to set up this values one. We're going to say that it's a JSON uh, base type and uh, we don't need it to be saved to disk and it is of remote bounding, binding type. And so the remote binding name in the payload that we saw was also values. So off we go. So values and values and save. And connected, saved, refresh. And look at this. We've already got a message here. So this looks a little bit familiar, doesn't it? We've gotten an array here that is containing the um, value time quality um, and we've also got this ID field that you can see, and the ID field is including the um, the tag name from from Kepware, which was sim.plc.sign3. I've just renamed uh, 
I've just renamed it here. So here you can see the channel, the, the device, and then obviously the tag. So great stuff. Uh, one thing I will mention while we're over here, just because I'm thinking about it, if we do go into Quick Client, Quick Client's got some nice features to it just because of the namespace that we're exposing here. And it can be quite handy. You can see I've got the IoT Gateway line one, line two, line three. So there's actually a topic here that's created in the um, OPC channel. Um, this is gonna give me a few statistics on each of these agents that I'm setting up. And here you can see that, that it has been sending updates. So there's 133 updates that have gone out. Um, this is a great way just to just to quick check if, uh, if it's actually sending data. Um, apologize, this is a little all over the place. But one of the things I didn't mention, which is why are we doing it this way, um, with the actual contacts being created here down at the IoT gateway. And the reason is because um, I could actually just create one and, and you can experiment doing this approach using IoT Edge or using an IoT uh, device uh, in Azure. The challenge is the more um, tags that we add to the list and the higher scan rates that we use, um, the problem is we can hit device throttling limits of an IoT device. So one of the things that I'm doing here is by separating them is to say this agent is for a particular uh, line and so the throttling limits are essentially going to be spread across the plants and, and the lines. Okay, so coming back to this, um, frankly, I scratched my head for a while, thinking, what am I going to do with this? How can I, how can I map these values into, into um, thing properties? And and at PTC, how we've done this in the past for something that, that some of you may have seen, the motor demo, is basically we just had a, um, a subscription that was looking at the values that were coming in, taking apart this structure, looking at the ID, and essentially having a, a select, uh, a switch that did a case selection to say, if this property is this, then I want to take this value and I'm going to set it to the property. So I actually have done this. Um, we're going to take a second. We're going to delete this device. Okay, so we got rid of the number three plant there. Off she goes. And um, let's have a look at what I set up. So... Um, I set the project context just to show me some of the things in this Azure IoT Kepra MQTT helper. And normally, yeah, okay, so that's showing me too much stuff. Basically, what I've done is there's there's two things that I'm going to call a couple of things that I'm going to call out here. I've created a thing shape, and the thing shape is. Um, implementing that values property that we just looked at. So that's going to create the automatic remote binding that is just going to start to receive the values from Kepware. And then we got to take it apart. When that value comes in, basically, when there's a, a data change on values, we're going to execute this process payload. So this is really where the magic is. And this is going to be implemented on a particular entity. And basically, wherever uh, whichever entity gets this implemented, if there's a data change on values, which should come in automatically, if we've got this connected, then it's gonna it's gonna run this. So I've kind of um, you know starting out, this is just the the event um, that's coming in with the um, the value, I'm breaking that into an array, and all I'm doing here, this is a, a quite simplistic. I did try some things that were a little bit more complex that didn't work so well. So I'm keeping it simple. I've made this binding array. And basically, the first part of the array is um, the tag that's coming from Kepware. And then the second part is going to be the property name in ThingWorks. So all I'm doing is I'm saying, look, if you see a tag that's called this, I want you to call it this in ThingWorks. So it's a little bit of an abstraction. As I say, very simple, but uh, it's working pretty, pretty slick. And um, 
And if we kind of continue down, one of the other things that I came across was that the way that we've done this in the past was really just to take the value field and then write that directly. But as we just saw, if it's 10 seconds or if it's 60 seconds or it can be quite long, we can have a lot of updates in one of those packages that uh, we really have no way of knowing if we're writing a value to the property, we have no way of knowing if this is the most recent value or even what the timestamp on that value is because of the fact we were looking at the, the time that it goes into the property. So I wanted to be a little bit more um, meticulous about this. And um, so I've implemented this with um, uh, VTQ, so value time quality, which is possible to use in, in ThingWorks. This is actually how ThingWorks works behind the scenes when we have a Kepwork connection set up. And basically there's this, if we come all the way to the bottom, there's this update property values service that is going to uh, essentially um, add those property values, or set them if you will, uh, as they're coming in and, and basically what I'm doing here is just parsing out the so this is the overall um, payload the data so we're going to go through the payload um, section by section and basically um, come back to some of these ifs but basically we're going to check we're going to split that binding up at the top that we saw there and we're going to compare it to the id the id on that particular message does that match the ID that we saw up here? And if yes, then we're gonna take the other part of it. We're gonna take that ramp, we're gonna call that property name, and then basically we're gonna compose this message down here, okay? So yeah, the time is data IT, property, the name is property name, and then data is Q. So it's pretty simple, actually. Um, it's pretty simple. I mean, that's the concept, basically, is just going through unpacking this message that's going to create a table um, with these uh, these values that are going to be added. So this brings us a really nice uh, function is that in order to have data coming in and not lose data, um, this I haven't seen any other implementations that have done this this way. And this is going to mean that we can actually set that 10 seconds all the way up to a minute or even five minutes, but we'll always have the entirety of the data that does finally make it to, to ThingWorks. So let's have a look at the implementation here. Uh, the next important thing um, here was the templates. And so basically I just made a template that is inheriting from the Azure IoT thing. So this is the parent um, for all IoT things from Azure. And you can see here, I also created a, a value stream and that value stream is gonna be used to store the um, uh, logged properties. Obviously, we're going to keep the times so they're going to be logged. And basically, I've just created um, those three, ramp, random, and sign. And I've done it in a way such that it's the same across each line to provide some extra abstraction and normalization. And um, nothing really, um, just a number. It's logged, right? We do want it to be logged to the value stream. Uh, didn't even set up a binding because this isn't really a binding, right? It's that, it's that subscription that's going to write in the values in here. So there's no binding uh, required. And uh, I think that's it, actually. Right. I didn't mention that we implemented that thing shape. That thing shape is the one that has the um, uh, the smarts in order to decode the payload coming from Kepware. And the reason that I put it on a thing shape is obviously just to keep it off of this hierarchy because of the fact that here I put the properties. So if you did have a different line style, uh, type of line, type of plant, you could use a, a thing template here to kind of capture this and then just still keep the code and the intelligence at the thing shape level. Obviously I was thinking, you know, trying to build something you know, that's easy to use. This isn't really production ready, but um, the concepts are there. So basically what I should need to do now is if I come back to that, um, connection services hub, this time, What did we do? Import. Right. Okay, so now we're going to import the IoT devices.
And here we're going to add that thing template that I just mentioned. And there's actually one thing I'm going to do first. I'm going to reconfigure my line. Uh, line one. Line one. So we're going to make line one be a little bit different. So line one is going to be every 60 seconds. Narrow format. And the tags in line one are set to scan every one second. And line two is We're going to speed up line two a little bit. OK. OK, so I made those changes there. Now, um, just need to make sure I actually deleted that. Can't recall. Yes, OK. So I did delete that. We're going to come back in here. We're going to import the devices. Uh, with that pattern, right? So there should only be the number three that's not imported yet. Good, job's done. And we've got the line three. We're gonna go through and do that thing again to, um, to connect it to its gateway thing. And there we go. OK, so it's connected. Now you'll see the ramp random and sign values that have come in on this thing template over here with the normal Azure IoT thing. So we don't actually have any properties up at the top of the list because we're not doing any bindings as in the classic sense of the bindings. We're doing it in the, in the subscription. And there we go. I just hit refresh and it took a little minute, but you see we do have some values here that have come in. Um, so I haven't configured anything else, but because of the fact that we had that list, that static list with the bindings written out, I had never connected the um, this particular line before, but because it knew the bindings, it was able to say, okay, I know that this is line three, I know this is ramp, random, and, and sign, and it's populated them. So. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Greg, how do we know that this is actually um, keeping the uh, the historical values there between the updates? Uh, that was actually why I changed one of the uh, update frequencies on the, the line one. Uh, I did actually make a little bit of a, a mashup. Um, it's actually maybe the first mashup with a trend that I've ever made. I'm not really a mashup guy, but um, anyways, I made one and it worked and um, so we've got this mashup here, and basically all I'm doing is, is just making some queries off of that thing template, uh, query implementing things, query implementing things with property history that are that are attached to a, a uh, selectable list over here, and there's a trend. It's freaking magical. Um, so we'll see if this works. Uh, here's our list. We have the three things that are lines, and um, Normally, if I click on one of these things, I should see some data, which I'm clearly not. Okay. Woo. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This isn't really working. I tried to make it bounded. Uh, it looks like we got some kind of weird back and forth bits because of... Um, I don't really know why. Anyways, um, this is the line one. We do have these three values that are coming in. Uh, if we click on line two, we should sort of see the similar type of thing. Actually, what's happening is the more data it's been collecting, it's taking a longer time to get the results back.
Okay, so if we have a look at line three, that one should be the fastest just because of the fact that it um, has just been set up. All right, so it's official. My mashup sucks. Um, okay, so I'm going to add some stuff in here that I don't really know. We'll try and turn the data set around and put a 500 record max on it. This is the fun part about making those scan rates so small is is now it's kind of messed up my um, data display obviously something to be cautious of so i should only get 500 results now from that query and let's see what happens Normally, this was supposed to be bound to the query for start and end, um, but the input parameters apparently didn't work. Anyways, we're going to leave it at that. Um, you'll take my word for it. The, um, the values, we did see them there briefly. Um, Essentially, and that was why I, I put the um, 200 millisecond, 250 millisecond scan rate, because those would be populating into that payload that by default can go up to 1,000 messages, updates. And client, right, max events per publish. So these are the number of, of overall tag updates. And so what we've set up there with that service and that subscription is that essentially in that subscription, it's going through here, um, is going through the entire update payload. So if this was a thousand tag updates, then it would go through one at a time. And basically it's adding to this, this VTQ um, update table. Um, here, this is an info table, create info table, table from data shape. So there's an info table in memory that's being populated based on the message that comes in that's essentially being decoded and, um, and then pushed into the value stream using update property values. So there you have it. Uh, I hope you find this useful. Uh, this kind of goes a little bit into detail on how this works between Kepware. Obviously, you could use this same concept for other MQTT type uh, uh, integrations. And, um, and as I say in the, um, in the intro, um, I'm not necessarily saying this is the appropriate way to do this, but really the purpose of this here is um, something that can be fast and something that can work so that you can focus on building your application in ThingWorks around the data that's coming in through Azure IoT and not getting too hung up on an in initial phase around the overall architecture. This is great, but one of the things that we're seeing is you might not necessarily want to start with all this just because of the fact that you're going to lose time in the pro project setup and there's a number of components that you obviously have to not only get working, but have some level of mastery. So there's a place for what I just showed you. Um, I hope you appreciate it. And uh, if you do have any questions or other comments, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments below. All right. Take care.